This morning we're going to turn to Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13 for our study. Zechariah 11, 12 and 13. Here is a prophecy concerning the betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. It is a mistake and it is wrong to think that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a fluke. That the mob got carried away and that it went further than Jesus had anticipated or planned. There are some who teach that such was the case, but that is manifestly wrong. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was something that was carefully planned and thought out by God millenniums before man ever existed. The Bible speaks about Jesus crucified from the foundations of the world. When Peter was talking to the Jews about the fact that Jesus had been crucified, he said unto them, And him hath ye crucified according to the predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was something that God had planned. It was a part of God's plan for man from the beginning. In Zechariah here, we are told concerning the crucifixion that Jesus would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, that the silver would be thrown down in the house of the Lord and then cast to the potter or used to buy a potter's field. As we turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, and we read Matthew's accounts of those things that preceded his crucifixion. Matthew tells us in verse 14 of chapter 26, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. Then over in chapter 27, beginning with verse 3, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood, the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? It's your problem. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And so they took counsel and they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. 
The fact that Zechariah predicted that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the silver would be cast down in the house of the Lord and ultimately used to buy a potter's field, can only prove that Zechariah did not write that out of his own knowledge but was inspired by the Spirit of God to write these things as he was writing in advance God's plan. Under the law, if you had an ox that was mean and prone to gore people, that should your ox gore a servant of a neighbor, a slave, you would have to give to your neighbor 30 pieces of silver in repatriation for his gored slave. That was the price for a slave who had been gored by an ox. No wonder the Lord said, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. What a cheap Price to sell out his Lord. Thirty pieces of silver. But it was all a part of God's plan. God told about it in advance. So it was not an accident. The price that was determined was not an accident. Now, there is a book that was written several years ago by a man by the name of Dr. Schoenfield called The Passover Plot, in which he got into a lot of meaningless speculation and came up with a lot of stupid conclusions and just dumb things concerning the death of Jesus Christ. The premise of the book was that Jesus plotted his own death. That's correct, and that would be an easy premise to prove. Of course he did. He plotted his own death. Hundreds of years before the fact. And he revealed the plot in the Old Testament prophets. So to say that he plotted his own death is, is, is nothing, really. I mean, it's an easy premise to prove. That is true. What Schoenfield carries that on to is what's ridiculous. Of course, his book received the fate that those kind of books deserve. It was lost in oblivion years ago. But yet, the premise that Christ plotted his own death is a correct premise. When questioned by Pilate, he said, for this cause, I came into the world. That was his purpose of coming. Now, if the death of Jesus Christ was something that God had planned and determined in advance. The question, of course, must be asked, why would God plan for his son to be crucified? God planned that his son be crucified because God wanted to demonstrate to man how much God loves man, even in his fallen state. You really don't know that God loves you apart from the death of Jesus Christ. 
The Bible only points to the death of Jesus Christ as the proof of God's love. It doesn't point to anything else as proving that God loves you except the death of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Herein is love. Not that we love God. Hey, it's no big deal. You come and say, oh, I love God. So what? No big deal. I mean, that's only using good sense. The big deal is that herein is love. Not that we love God, but that God loves us. Now, that's a big deal. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. For God has manifested or demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And Jesus himself said, Greater love has no man than this, than a man will lay down his life for his friend. So you only know that God loves you because Jesus died for you and that's the proof that God gives to man that he loves us. You see, the Bible does say that the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows forth his handiwork and day unto day they utter their speech. In other words, universally man believes in the existence of God because it's obvious by nature. Nature testifies to man of the existence of God. But it is important to note that the nature that is testifying to man of the existence of God is fallen nature cursed by sin. And so man gets a perverted concept of God. You do not see nature as God created it. You see nature in its cursed state. You do not see the animal kingdom as God created it or as God intends it. When you see the animal kingdom as God intends it in the kingdom age, the Bible says that the lion will lie down with a lamb and a little child shall lead them. Can't you imagine what a fantastic pet a lion would make for little kids? Man, jumping on their back, grabbing hold of their mane and saying, Go! You know. (laughs) And racing across the field on the top of a lion. And grabbing the thing by the mane and leading it around, you know. And just have the lion being a loving, gentle creature, just licking the little kids and all. and, And man, what a neat pet that would make. Such will be the case in the kingdom age because the curse will be gone. But as I watch the lion today as it chases that wildebeest or it chases the gazelle or a deer and pounces upon it and begins to pull off the flesh and all, and I think, oh, that's horrible, that's cruel, that's heartless. And the message that I'm getting concerning God in nature is that of cruelty, heartlessness. And man is getting a false idea of God because he is seeing God through fallen nature, through nature that is cursed by sin. So it was necessary that man's concepts of God be corrected It was necessary that man once again know that God is love. And so God sent his only begotten son to declare to man that God is love. And then he proved it. He went to the cross and he died for man. Proving to man that God is love. But not only did he prove to us that God is love through the death, and that was not the only purpose for the cross, the cross also proves to man the value 
that God places on life, human life. Now, we as individuals place a great value on our own lives, but a lesser value on other lives. And that's tragic. That man has placed such a small value on the lives of others. You see, according to God, a man's life is more valuable than the entire world. But man doesn't see it that way. Just a little remote frozen island down in the South Atlantic called the Falklands or Malvinas, whichever side you're on. Man considers that so valuable that he's willing to send other men out to die. in order that they might assert sovereignty over this little island in the South Atlantic. It just is a, another proof of the lack of value that we place on human life. That's sad. It's a sad indictment against man. Because God places such a tremendous value on man, he was willing to redeem man even though it cost the life of his only begotten son. That's how valuable you are to God. For we are redeemed, the Bible said, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, Man was willing to sell God for 30 pieces of silver. A goodly price, God said, I was prized of by them. But all of the silver in the universe was not enough in God's estimation to redeem man, to buy man. He sent his only begotten son in order that you might know how valuable God esteems you. Worth more than the whole world in God's eyes. Now, this creates a very interesting paradox. Man has put such a small value on God that he was willing to sell him for 30 pieces of silver and God places such a large value on man. Greater than any material possession. The act of Judas in selling Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver is something that all men since have held in greatest contempt. So much so that the name of Judas has become a byword for a man who is mean, heartless, contemptible, we say, oh, he's a Judas. He would sell his own mother. He's a Judas. And we look upon such a one with utter contempt that he would be so heartless, so mercenary, that he would sell his Lord. He would profit off of his relationship with Jesus. Unfortunately, He's only the first of a long line who have been willing to profit off of their relationship with Jesus Christ. But the question I'd like to ask you is, why do we hold Judas in such contempt? Because he sold out so cheaply? 
Had Judas, say, bargained for 30 million pieces of silver, would he then be a hero in your eyes? Would, would you then admire him for his business acumen and his shrewdness? Would you then look up to him? Don't we look up to many rich people who have gained their riches by fraudulent means? Is it that he sold out too cheaply and we are, can, are contempt, we have contempt towards him because of the cheap price? You know, the truth is that some of you, as Judas, have been willing to sell out your relationship with the Lord for a very cheap price. You're not really much different from Judas. What is the relationship with the Lord worth to you? You know, Satan has the philosophy that every man has his price. Satan knows human motivations. And Satan would like to draw you away from your fellowship with the Lord. He'd like you to sell out your relationship. And do you know that some have sold out their relationship with Jesus Christ for just an illicit affair? For a moment's excitement or thrill? In order that they might indulge the lust of their own flesh, they've turned their back on the Lord. That illicit affair, let me ask you, is it worth it? The loss of your relationship with God for the love of a strange woman, is it worth it? Better yet, if I could only ask you a thousand years down the road, was it worth it? I know immediately what the answer would be. No, if you're selling out your relationship with Jesus for something like that, oh, you're worse than Judas. Some people are selling out their relationship with Jesus Christ for dishonest gain. A little cheating, a little corruption in their business dealings. And they're willing to sell out their relationship with God in order that they might gain a little more in their crooked business practices. What makes you any different from Judas? Why should we not hold you in contempt as we hold him in contempt? Because you're selling out something that is priceless for something that is going to waste away and be destroyed and you won't be able to take it with you anyhow. What shall it profit a man if he would gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you, by your corrupt, dishonest practices, could amass to yourself the wealth of the world and make the whole world your slaves and you'd be sitting at the top of the totem pole and everybody has to look up to you but in so doing, 
You sold out your relationship with Jesus Christ. What real value would you have? Some people have sold out their relationship with Jesus Christ for just a euphoric high that they might get from some drug or from alcohol. For those few moments of bombed oblivion where all inhibitions are released and you, for, you can forget your problems or you can cope. But you see, the people who are selling out so cheaply, hoping that somehow they'll be able to skirt around the corner, hoping that somehow they can maintain a relationship with the Lord, they don't stop to read the scriptures in Galatians 5 where he talks of the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, and the lying the stealing, the use of drugs and drunkenness. And then he concludes, for we know that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You're selling out. You're presuming on the grace of God. You are using the grace of God as a cloak to cover your own lasciviousness. And Paul the Apostle would be the first to say, God forbid! Who do you think you are to presume upon God and His grace and mercy towards you? As God has warned, and they who have been often reproved, who harden their necks, will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Is it worth it, Judas? Is it worth it to sell your Lord, your relationship with your Lord, for 30 paltry pieces of silver? God said, a good price that I was prized of at them. Cast it away. What a fool to sell so cheaply. I almost said the most valuable thing you have is your life. The courts are beginning to determine the value of life in wrongful death suits. They're determining how much a person would have been worth had he been able to live. He could have earned this much money in his lifetime and so forth. So they are making judgments and awards according to what the earning capacity potential might have been for a person had he been able to live out his normal lifespan. And so the wrongful death suits are something that are uh, being awarded constantly in courts today. Satan, in his astute understanding of the human personality and motivations said to the Lord concerning man skin for skin all that a man has will he give for his life now the psychologists have sort of confirmed that in their declaration that self-preservation is the strongest instinct that man has the instinct of self-preservation you'll give everything for your life take it all you know just don't, don't kill me, you know. Take everything. All that a man has, he'll give for his life. After all, you know, you can take what I've got, but if I still have my life, I have a chance to regain it. But the most valuable thing I possess is not really my life. The most valuable thing I possess is my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's more valuable than my life itself. Someday this life is going to be snuffed anyhow. But my relationship with God through Jesus Christ is something that is eternal. And that is the most important thing to me and the most valuable thing that I possess. Because that's eternal. And it would be sheer 
folly for me to sell out that relationship for any material thing or physical thing that is going to pass. Sheer folly to sell my Lord so cheaply or to sell him at all. Satan's philosophy, all that a man has will he give for his life. That philosophy only exists because Satan doesn't know the joy and the blessing of being born again and walking in fellowship with God. There's nothing, nothing that I would take for my relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a song, I think, they used to sing it in church years ago when I was a kid. Take the whole world but give me Jesus. He's worth more. The value that you put on your relationship with God, what is it? What kind of a value do you put on your relationship with Him? What value does God have in your mind? As far as God is concerned, the value that He has placed on you far greater than any material thing in this universe. And we are foolish if we place a lesser value on God than he has placed on us. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you did prize us so highly. You did love us so much that you sent your Son to redeem us from our sin. Oh God, what a tragedy that our Lord should be sold for 30 pieces of silver, which he was never able to use anyhow, which was soon lost, cast away. Oh God, keep those here today from that same tragic mistake that Judas made. Help us, God, to evaluate our lives, our relationship with you. And if there is anything, God, that is taking away, diminishing, or robbing us of our fellowship and walk with you, God, may we, by your grace, have enough sense to get rid of it, to cast it aside, that nothing, Lord, would stand in the way of our fellowshipping with you. Speak to our hearts, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus asked a poignant question. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What kind of a price do you have on your relationship with God? I trust that in response to such a query, you would all answer, hey, my soul is not for sale. I don't care what the enemy would offer. I'm not for sale. I wouldn't sell out to Satan for anything. I certainly respect your wisdom. But if you are selling out, or worse yet, giving away that relationship with God for some foolish, stupid thing, then I hardly can admire you. I only have to look upon you as I do Judas. As a fool.
Maybe today you'd like to restore a relationship with God. That's what it's all about. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died. God values you so much, he's not willing to let you go. He's not willing to let you just perish in your own folly. His love goes far beyond our foolishness. And he sent his son to take our sins in order that he might make the path back into fellowship with God. And I'd encourage you to forsake whatever it is that you've allowed to rob you of your walk and your relationship with Jesus Christ and come back into that richness of his love, into the fullness of his grace, and do it today. The prayer room is on your far right, the door that goes behind the block wall, and the pastors will be back there to pray with anyone who would like to come and renew your relationship with the Lord today. God's speaking to your heart. He's tugging. The wisest thing you could do would be to respond. God bless you. May God watch over you this week. May he keep you in his love. May he strengthen you and help you that you might experience his power working in you, doing for you what you can't do for yourself, giving you his victory and bringing to you the full joys and blessings of walking in close fellowship with him.